All right, so our last video on the MKBHD channel talked about Apple and we called it the paradox of choice. You could call it the illusion of choice, a bunch of different ways to phrase it, but it's an, it's a topic that's come up a bunch in the news lately. And mm -hmm. I, this was, a I felt like a great way of summarizing it because I went straight to the analogy of comparing it to sharks. And I can't believe how well this worked, but it was such a good analogy I had yeah. to run with it. No, it was. So picture this, you've seen sharks in the aquarium. Maybe you've seen videos of sharks on YouTube, whatever. And you know how sometimes you see those like little sharks like swimming right next to the shark, the or, like a little shark, attached yeah. to it, a little fish. And it's like sometimes suctioned onto the side of the shark mm -hmm. or like swimming right next to it. If you look up what those sharks do, that's called a remora fish. Those little, they're sharks technically, but they're little oh, fish. Oh, are they sharks? Okay. Yeah, but they're called remoras. And basically, they have evolved over time to be mostly dependent on the sharks. And it's a win-win relationship because that remora fish will hitch a ride on the shark and can eat scraps of food, whatever the shark's messily eating. It's just like, all right, free food. Eats stuff around there. It's kind of got this bodyguard where there are no natural predators about to swim up to a shark and try yeah, to pick right. one of those things off. So it's pretty good for the remora but also it's eating parasites off of the shark's back. And it's like actually kind of a healthy thing for a shark to have a couple of those hanging around. And so the more you look into this remora fish and the relationship with the shark, the more interesting it gets. Turns out <laughs> the the dorsal fin of remora fish is actually modified and evolved over time to literally become a suction cup. The dorsal fin, the thing on the back? Yeah. Does it like come over like an angler fish? And no, then... it's like the it oh, used to have a normal dorsal fin, and over time it evolved that into a suction cup. Oh. Because over time, the most successful remoras are the ones that are able to stick to the shark the longest, wow. and it's literally now evolved to be dependent on the shark by this like suction cup. And if you take one out the water, you can suction it onto a wall, and it just stays there. <laughs> so, all this is to say, <laughs> there are a number of uh, dynamics like that in the tech world. Yeah. Also, how. How long till like Coyote Peterson's coming onto the channel? Because we've been doing a lot of weird nature, nature like analogies. I would love that actually. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. he's got a great channel. Actually, I would just love to talk to him on the pod or like his team because mm -hmm. the stuff they film out out in the wild is pretty it pretty is. crazy for like a YouTube channel. Yeah, but okay, sorry. But anyway, so yeah, this this dynamic exists a lot in the tech world, and uh, in this video, I used Apple as an example where Apple is the shark. And there's a bunch of companies that are specifically evolved to fill in the gaps of what Apple doesn't do. Their whole business is to do something that Apple doesn't do for existing Apple customers, mm -hmm. which is uh, turns out a really dangerous place to live because <laughs> at any point, Apple can decide that is a good idea and just do that thing. Um, so we, we made this video, it's called the Apple and the Paradox of Choice, and, and you can watch it on the channel, and I, I suggest watching it, actually. It's, it's quite a good video. Uh, but, you know, Gruber wrote an article, actually, about that same topic, which I thought, like, boiled it down really nicely, which is if, if you are a company, whether you, you know, are, are accessory to Apple or anyone else, and you make a business out of filling in a gap that one of these companies has, you should expect if that idea is good enough, you should expect that company to eventually take that idea. And whether that means they will put you out of business or acquire you or copy you or whatever, that that either any one of those things could happen, but you should expect if that good if that idea is actually good, you should expect them to take it from you. Which is it's pretty not true. some yeah, it's it makes sense. It's hard to say like that. Oh man, I feel like that, that's what's so hard about all of this is it's so easy to kind of argue both ways. Like, why should I create something that's not been created and then expect to get destroyed later on? It, it kind of yeah. like, I guess the like the anti-competition part of that is like people might think of something great and then never make it because they're just going to assume they're going to put all this hard work towards something and That'll then get disappear. crushed later. That doesn't amount to anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's tougher with Apple. And I think Gruber was talking about this in the Apple because we were talking about Apple. Yeah. Like, Apple very rarely, at least, I can't think of something off the top of my head, and I'm sure there are, but like they don't acquire things as often as, say, like Google does. So Apple, if you're making something that is specifically for Apple products, which is very, very popular That's because a lot of things. Apple's very popular, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would always be worried that Apple's just around the corner if my idea is doing well 
and just take it and then I'm lost in the dust. Or if I was developing something that works for Android or something like that, you see Google acquiring people all the time. I, I think one of my options would be like, I'm gonna make this awesome product. If they never compete with me, I have an awesome product. If they wanna compete with me, there's a good chance I might get acquired and then at least my product's continuing. Whether I have a say in it or not, I'll make a ton of money if that's it's probably the goal for a lot of people. This was, yeah. it reminds me of Shark Tank. Whenever someone comes on to Shark, sharks are coming up again. Whenever someone goes on Shark Tank. Welcome to the Shark, I know. shark Form Podcast, shark week. baby. It's yeah. Shark Week. But whenever someone goes on the show and like has an idea that seems like it might be able to be easily copied, Kevin O'Leary will always go like, if you can't protect this, the big guys are just going to squash you like the little bug you are. He always says that. But it's kind of true, which is like, if your idea isn't that good, you probably won't be squashed. But if your idea is actually that good, you can expect them to make a move to either take that idea or or just fill in the gap where you were where you were being successful. So, yeah, it's tough. It's tough in today's world because the way everything's set up, that is what's going to happen. And you should kind of expect it. I guess what people are trying to fight with right now and the reason we're seeing Apple brought up a lot and anti-competition, antitrust is people trying to figure out how to change those rules so something like that doesn't happen. I do not know where to even begin with that. Um, but I guess I totally understand wanting to make a, a world where you don't have to live in constant fear of just yeah. pure capitalism punching you in the back of the head. Well, that's actually a pretty, that's a decent segue into Apple versus Epic, which is uh, an ongoing trial. Now, there's a lot of Apple versus things okay, out there in the world right now, and we could talk about any of them, but Apple versus Epic is interesting because of the specific Literally, okay, Apple built this thing yeah. called the App Store. And if you just break it down, I always I try to see both sides of every argument or every verses, and it is, for me, very easy to see both sides. So Apple built the App Store. Epic makes one of the apps in the App Store, and the App Store policy is that they take 30% cut of all in-app purchase transactions. Yeah, That's just the way it is on the App Store if you want to exist. And the epic argument is, that's too much. Why do you deserve 30% of all the money that we're bringing you? And Apple's going, that we could have charged way more. We built the App Store. We made the rules. You don't have to be on the App Store, but because you're here, yeah, we deserve the 30% cut. And so now there's all the anti-competitive arguments about, well, what other App Stores are there? Like, what are the other rules? You don't have enough competition to change that 30% around, blah, blah, blah. I just think, I, I find it very easy to see both sides, which is pretty yeah. pretty interesting to actually you know, like be able to focus on both. And, um, I, I think our knowledge and stuff like this is very surface level because it would be impossible for us to know like every detail of this. Mm -hmm. Like these lawyers are insane, the the arguments they can come up with. Um, but like to kind of recap back onto it, Apple obviously charges thirty percent. We've known that for a long time. Epic got upset with that and instead of going straight into some sort of lawsuit their first or maybe they went into a lawsuit but the big news that broke was that they like entered in a way to circumvent buying things through the app store mm -hmm. which then apple got mad at kicked them off their store google also kicked them off the play store because of that and because of all of that that's what started the first suit i think we talked about it three or four months ago. Yeah, they um, knew what they were doing with that. Yeah, now, now we're getting into the trial aspect of it. I think it just started May 1st was the first day. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have a lot of updates. There's a lot of arguing back and forth, obviously. Um, one thing I did find kind of interesting the other day, um, there's a Bloomberg article. And while it didn't have much about it, they one of the Apple lawyers argued that, so originally, so, so I think cross-platform play is the biggest thing Fortnite did. Like it was the th one of the things that made it as successful as it was because when you have friends who have all different types of consoles or PCs or even phones, if you can let all of them play together no matter what they're on, that's amazing. Yeah. Sony at first didn't let you play with other cross, despite the fact that PC and Xbox could play or Switch could play, mm -hmm. Sony would not let you play on PlayStation with others. And eventually... They got Sony to allow cross-platform play, but an Apple lawyer brought or specifically asked Tim Sweeney. So Sony finally agreed to cross-platform play, but has never agreed to cross-wallet transaction. Is that correct? Which Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic, replied yes. So 
I find that kind of, I, I don't know exactly how wallet transactions work on the Sony store. I'm assuming they take some sort of cut through anything. Yeah. The other thing is people talk about, will probably say like, well, why don't you just take 30% off the initial purchase and why don't you let them do their microtransactions like normal? The issue is, is the, the most popular way of games these days is free to play yep. microtransactions. So that's impossible. Like Apple yeah. is not going to take no cut of Fortnite. Of course. That's dumb. Um, but Sony now not including wallet transactions, is this a little, I'm, I'm assuming that question out that goes out there to be along the lines of, is this a little hypocritical that you're coming at Apple for trying to take microtransactions, but it doesn't seem like you're going after what, uh, yeah. Sony. It's just, I just think it's so fascinating that you can easily paint both sides as totally in the right or wrong. Like, okay, listen to this is, this is the, uh, let's start with like the obvious Apple is wrong argument, right? Mm -hmm. Apple Apple will take 30% of all in-app purchase dollars, and you are not allowed, if you're in the App Store, to go around that. So if you have in-app purchases, you can't go, hey, pay us through this like credit card form or like this mm -hmm. other thing. If you want to do in-app purchases in your App Store app, you have to go through Apple's way, and they will take a 30% cut. So that means... so. This kind of came up, which was funny in the the podcast argument. Apple is starting this new podcast subscription service where you, you can subscribe to a podcast and pay them like sort of directly, mm -hmm. and Apple will take a cut. And Apple takes that, I think, thirty percent cut. And so Spotify announced a competing same thing, where oh, okay, we'll have subscriptions, but you can do that for free. But all of the money that Apple makes or that Spotify makes in the App Store gets cut off 30% to Apple anyway. So all of the money that Spotify is making in the App Store goes directly to Apple 30%. Uh, or not not all of it. 30% of that money goes to Apple anyway. So it's kind of like they're losing money to Apple in order to make a better product. The point is, why is it exclusive? Why don't you have the ability to do other transaction methods? And Apple will always argue, oh, for the security of it, everyone knows Face ID mm -hmm. and everything is so secure with our... You know portals and everything, but it's uh, it's pretty anti-competitive at the same time. Yeah, I mean, they also can make the argument, and it's a one hundred percent true argument that your stuff on the App Store is going to make more money if it is there. So, like, I'm sure they argue plenty of times. Yeah, we're taking thirty percent, but I bet you you're making more than that. Yeah, so, so where that's if you the other on the App Store. That is yeah, that's that the other side. So Apple's going. Wait a second. Wait a second. We run a store. We built the store. We've put the money into creating the best store. We deserve the money that we make from the store. By the way, most stores charge more than 30%. Mm -hmm. If you look at like wholesale pricing versus regular pricing in a store, like to get something on the shelf of Walmart, your thing isn't 30% less for no. Walmart. It's like 50, 60, 70% less for Walmart. And by the way, uh, YouTube takes 45% from all creators. I don't know if people knew that, but. 45% of AdSense revenue goes to Google and YouTube. 55% goes to the creator. So 30%, Apple's like, you're welcome. We only take 30%. Yeah. And uh, I think David pointed this out in the studio earlier. Like when they first announced that 30% cut on stage, mm -hmm. everyone applauded. When we sell the app through the App Store, the developer gets 70% of the revenues right off the top. We talk about the 70-30 revenue split, but the developer gets to pick the price. And you know what price a lot of developers are going to pick? free, right? So when a developer wants to distribute their app for free, there is no charge for free apps at all. There's no charge to the user. And like was very happy. Yeah. It, <laughs> Developers are very happy about that. So that's the other side of that. So it's just it seems so easy to paint either side as pretty pretty good. Like I think they have a good yeah. point. So that's why it's such a fascinating issue. So um our our channel friend Como Code actually tweeted a, a pretty, a pretty interesting video of Tim Sweeney in 2012, where he actually says, "We're now in a time where indie developers can flourish thanks to the App Store," which is just a long roller coaster of events to get to where we are. And, and in his defense, and in everybody's defense, we talk about that. We talk about 30% maybe not being that bad, but it's I'm not against trying to move forward and move to a better system and like. You know what? Maybe thirty percent is too much now. Yeah, like it wasn't there, too much then. Is there an answer now to like solve everything? Like just make it fifteen percent, or just let us get around the cut? Like 
everyone's going to take advantage of whatever mm -hmm. change you make. So if Apple goes, all right, you don't have to be exclusive to our in-app purchase anymore, they'll never do that. But if they did, everyone would stop giving a 30% cut to Apple. It just makes financial sense. They would incentivize the credit card form or whatever other thing that takes less of a cut. Yeah, so I mean, I think all these trials are ultimately to find a way that hopefully works for both. I know that will probably never happen because that's just what should happen and why would that ever actually be the result? But um, I think there's, like, like we both said, there's a million ways to argue both sides. Everyone's gonna have their opinion. Everyone's gonna have their biases. And I think it's something that is so hard, it's going to be a very long time before we find out what official yeah. rules are gonna become. And I don't know when this trial is set to end, but I'm pretty sure It'll not much while. is going to come out of it It'll for be a, a while. long time.